The RealAgriculture.com Beef School is presented by DuPont Pioneer. To find more Beef School episodes, go to beefschool.ca. So its importance is really a relative thing. It depends on what the overall risk level would be for an individual operation. In a truly uh, closed herd where there was no other animals coming in and there was complete no contact with any other animals along fence line or anything like that, vaccination really has a minimal importance. But when we start to increase the risk level in terms of we don't have an open herd, we're bringing in animals from different sources, we're taking animals into the feed yard where we're co-mingling, then vaccination becomes of paramount importance. So it really just depends on what the individual producers risk factors are. Uh, out of the calf crop, there's 85% of calves within Western Canada that do receive at least one vaccine. That vaccine is, is typically a clostridial, so the black leg vaccine. And if we're looking at the other vaccines, we're, we're actually looking at a lot lower percentage, around that 55% when we're thinking of things like BVD and IBR vaccination. On the cow side, about 50% of cows are vaccinated with at least a clostridial stridial vaccine, so that black leg or that eight way, and a much lower percentage would be vaccinated for anything else. So there certainly is a, a wide range of producers that, out there, uh, typically depending also on their geographical area and risk levels based off of that too. Timing is very important, both in terms of effect and also in terms of risk level. So we always want to be on label. That gives us the assurance that we're using those vaccines appropriately based off of what the label says, the manufacturer's specifications or recommendations. On top of that, if we do have some leeway, we also need to think about that timing. And it's not always just what is best for that protection. There's a tons of there's tons of logistical constraints that goes along with that. The, the labor force that you have during a, a specific time of year, whether that be in the fall or the spring. So really we need to look at which diseases specifically that we're trying to protect against and then tailoring the timing more specifically. So we'll just use one example. One would be IBR or BVD type abortions in cows while they're pregnant. If you wanted the best possible protection, what you would do is you would vaccinate those cows as close to breeding season as possible. That's when those cows are gonna be infected and have that early embryonic death or, or death loss in that herd. That would mean a pre-breeding vaccination schedule and based off of what the constraints would be for that individual producer, you may not be able to run your cattle through and do a processing event at that time. So you would have to rely on when the last time they were through the shoot was. And a lot of times that is fall preg testing, which is still a very good time to do your preg test or to do your vaccination. But like I said, it's a little delayed in terms of when that animal is going to be exposed to those pathogens and when we really want to have an effect. So I think the most important thing that is often forgot is just to refresh ourselves on that label. Are we giving it to the appropriate class of animal? Are we using the appropriate dosage? And are we using the appropriate site of administration, whether that be intermuscular or subcutaneously? And if we just brushed up a little bit on that, I think we could prevent a lot of issues. For example, going with, uh, let's say, an intermuscular when it should have been subcutaneous, you're not going to have as good of effect as you potentially could have or the other I think big thing is is also just on the label is what the mixing instructions would say one big challenge that I see is is people mixing up products like modified live vaccine and they're letting it sit out uh, for several hours when really we should be using that vaccine as quick as possible our recommendation is two to three hours of refrigerated max uh, before that vaccine starts to become inactivated you guys really need to focus on making sure that those vaccines are protected while they're both in the syringe and in the bottle 
throttled during that branding time, during that, that preg test time. Uh, it seems like every time we do those vaccinations, the weather is always horrible. It's always really hot or really cold, and we need to protect those vaccines. They're very, very fragile. So using extra coolers and keeping them uh, at appropriate temperature, using things like uh, styrofoam coolers with holes cut in them that we can use as holsters just to try to maintain that temperature as best as we can because we need to ensure that that, that investment that we're putting in as a vaccine is actually getting us that benefit. Uh, we're very strict within our practice of encouraging people to do proper syringe maintenance. We want to make sure that those syringes are clean and well maintained so they're getting an appropriate dosage. And one thing that's not known is, is inside the barrel when you're cleaning a multi-dose syringe, you never ever want to put any sort of detergent. I think that's relatively well known. Uh, that cleaning solution can, can disrupt or denature that vaccine uh, particle and there's not as good of an effect. But there's other things we need to think about too, like using antibiotics in our multi-dose syringe that drives me absolutely crazy. If you put tetracyclines in that multi-dose syringe, no amount of washing is going to be able to get that antibiotic out and that's going to deactivate the vaccine the next time we put it in. And lastly, even, even just uh, high mineral content water, regular tap water, when it's used to rinse out the barrel of the syringe, can cause problems with the vaccine. We always encourage people to do a distilled water rinse that has no mineral content to make sure that that barrel is as clean as possible. It's so incredibly important. On top of that, with the, the appropriate, I guess, technique and then on top of that, the appropriate equipment, it, it really is dependent on which class of animal that you're doing and where that vaccine is going. So for example, in a subcutaneous injection on a smaller calf, you would need to use a smaller gauge needle uh, with a smaller length in, in contrast to a large bull getting a, a foot rod vaccine, you would need to go with a, a larger gauge and a, a longer needle. So you have to tailor that for those specific animals and your veterinarian can certainly help you determine which is most appropriate for each category. Yeah, so we encourage our producers to do it annually, uh, both for ease of our operations in terms of, of making sure you guys are getting exactly what you need, but also making sure there's no confusion on your end. So we encourage everybody that once a year that we sit down with them or even over the phone and go through a customized vaccination protocol that's printed out that you have for those, those references that you know that in the fall you're going to be giving these specific vaccines to this specific class of of animal and it's important to do that every year for two reasons the first reason is just to keep it fresh and so the veterinarian would know what's going on with that operation what new risks have come up what the disease challenges have been for the last year but on on the flip side we also need to do that to fulfill some of the regulatory components within within western canada we need to be able to fulfill that a valid vet client relationship is established that we know the disease challenges in your herd and we're doing appropriate uh, prescriptions to make sure that we f that we fall in line with all of the regulatory requirements. A product like a, a, a modified live vaccine is a prescription product and we need to have that ongoing conversation to make sure that prescription is valid. Yeah, so the majority of the of the regulation changes have been focusing on the injectable and in-feed antimicrobials, things like the penicillins and the tetracyclines that traditionally we've been able to get at, at feed stores and, and vet clinics. Going forward, those are all going to be under prescription and there's going to be a need to have that vet client relationship and that valid prescription in place to be able to access those types of things. Something like a modified live vaccine, there's gonna be absolutely no change to to how that relationship has been set up. They have been prescription products. You've only ever been able to get them from a veterinarian or a pharmacy. So nothing is really going to change there. But the one little logistical thing is if the feed stores are not necessarily selling as many livestock products as they used to, they may not carry some of the other vaccines that they traditionally have, like an eight-way, which is, has not required a prescription and will continue to not require a prescription. 
but just because of the logistics of whether or not they're going to be carrying animal health products, those might be pulled from the feed stores in the future, but not too many changes. Mm -hmm.